Welcome to this modified Nine Lessons and Carols, which originated from King's Chapel, Cambridge, England. Uh, you know how much I like all things English, uh, except for Marmite. I haven't acquired a taste for that uh, extract, yeast extract, but uh, uh, my daughter is uh, a first year student at Cambridge in England and uh, at uh, Newnham University. Uh, but this is the 100th anniversary of the Nine Lessons and Carols from Cambridge. We're doing the modified version, which is six lessons. Uh, the original version tells the story of salvation beginning with the fall of Adam, but we pick up the story with the prophets who foretell the coming of the Christ child and we see its fulfillment in the birth stories and so let us uh, use this bidding prayer and I have adapted it for our purposes but this is the prayer that would be prayed tomorrow night as the whole world gathers around the manger scene let us pray Beloved in Christ, be it this day our care and delight to prepare ourselves to hear again the message of the angels, and heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is to come to pass, the babe lying in a manger. Let us read in Mark and Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God foretold by the prophets and fulfilled in the birth of the Holy Child. Therefore, let us make this sanctuary glad with carols of praise. But first, let us pray for the needs of His whole world, for peace and goodwill over all the earth for unity and brotherhood within the church of Jesus Christ all over the world. And because this would cause Christ to rejoice, let us at this time remember in his name the poor and the helpless, the cold, the hungry, and the oppressed, the sick in body and in mind, and them who love him not, or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. Lastly, let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no man can number, whose hope was in the word made flesh, and with whom in this Lord Jesus we forevermore are one. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven in the words in which Christ himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 to 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. 
before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Please be seated. Our second lesson comes from the prophet Micah, the fifth chapter, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be one of peace. Yeah. 
comes from Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. <clears throat> in the six months, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for who who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her.
Our fourth lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 20. Tells the story of our Savior's birth. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judah, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But treasure, but Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them.
Please be seated. The fifth lesson comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, are no by means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the child had appeared, when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went to the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road.
Our sixth lesson comes from the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Stephen Gretchen very much. The sermon scripture text this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he'd resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord to the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm about to tell you a very sad story. But one not much different from those we hear almost on a weekly basis in the news. They capture our attention throughout the year, including the season of Advent. A few years ago, in a suburb of Rochester, New York, Peter Lowenheim was out walking his dog. He was surprised to see an ambulance parked down the street. What was going on, he wondered. Well, as it turned out, a terrible tragedy. An elderly couple, just two doors down, had died in their sleep the night before due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Lohenheim was shocked not only by their untimely deaths, but by the fact he didn't know these people. He didn't know they had no friends to speak of, no family, no one to stop by and check in on them. Soon a for sale sign appeared in front of the house, but everything else remained the same. And it was then that Lohenheim realized that there was little sense of community in the suburban neighborhood where he lived. A family vanished, yet the impact on our neighborhood was slight, writes Lohenheim in a book called In the Neighborhood. And he asked himself, how can this be? Do I live in a house? on the street, surrounded by people, living their lives in isolation? Good question. Now most city dwellers assume that things are much different in small towns. Now I spent most of my life living in small towns and I can tell you, it's been my experience, there's no difference. You may know the latest gossip a bit faster on your neighbors than we do in the city, but do any of us really live in community or a collection of isolated houses? Well, to find an answer, Lowen High did something quite unexpected and downright radical. He asked his neighbors if he could sleep at their houses. You're right. He requested that he be able to spend the night with them, to get them to know them better. And although his daughter said, Dad, you are crazy, a surprising number, number of his neighbors agreed with his request. 
And the result is the book in the neighborhood, The Search for Community on an American Street, One Sleepover at a Time. Well, a similar situation existed about 2015 years ago when God surveyed the scene on earth and what he saw was violence and isolation in every nation, race and culture. The human neighborhood was fractured, splintered then, just as it is now with people separated from God and alienated from each other. So, God decided to do what no one ever expected a divine being to do. Sleep over. As the story in the Gospel of Matthew began, God comes to a sleeping man named Joseph and speaks to him in a dream. Joseph is engaged to a girl named Mary, who's just discovered that she's pregnant. Because they haven't yet begun to live together, this pregnancy is pretty scandalous. And Joseph, being a righteous man, unwilling to expose Mary to public disgrace, plans to dismiss her. In other words, break up with her. So into the neighborhood comes a messenger from God, an angel. He says to the sleeping man, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God's word comes to the voice of an angel, letting Joseph know that Mary's baby is a gift from God and that the baby, who is to be named Jesus, will save his people from their sins. In particular, the sins that shatter our relationships with God and our neighbors. But that's not all. Matthew goes on to tell us that all this took pl place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken a long time ago to the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew realizes that God isn't simply coming over for one isolated sleepover in a visit from an angel to a sleeping man. No, God is with us. He's moving in with us permanently. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us now and forever. Don't bother to make up a bed in the guest room. It's time to build an addition. God knows we have trouble with our neighbors. You know the ones. Loud, late parties, no respect for the neighborhood speed limits. Their lawns are neglected in the summer and their sidewalks are treacherous in the winter. Neighbors can be a pain. But as bad as these relationships between people can be, our relationships with God aren't so good either. We indulge our selfish desires. We neglect the Lord's commandments and drive fast through life without thinking of the consequences. We neglect Jesus' teachings and don't put much effort into building a truly Christian community. You know, from the Lord's perspective, each of us can be a pain, too. But despite all this, God wants to move in with us, get to know us better, and repair the broken 
relationships that we have with him. God breaks through the divine human barrier, barriers through Jesus. And he challenges us to break through the human, human barriers as well. God comes to us, Emmanuel. God with us. Because God wants to be in the neighborhood. So what does God discover when he moves in? Some of the same things that Lohenheim uncovers when he packs up his overnight bag and walks to his neighbor's house for a sleepover. First, lots of people today are terribly lonely and don't know how to make connections. The first neighbor that Lohenheim spends the night with is a widower whose name is Tony Guzetta. Tony enjoys his afternoon beer, his dog, and his local YMCA support group. Yet he often feels alone. He tries to reach out to others by delivering dinners to new arrivals in the community, but his kind gestures are rarely returned. In so many communities today, we have lost the skills and the ability to create neighborly bonds. At one point, Gazetta says to Lohenheim, there are no neighbors here. Theologian Paul Tillich saw this coming. Observing that Separation is an aspect of everybody's experience, and sin is separation. To be in the state of sin is to be in the state of separation. Separation from other people. Separation from ourselves. Separation from God. But the good news of Christmas is that God enters human life in Jesus to overcome that separation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, says the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. As ambassadors of Christ, we are to do what we can to reach out for others, make connections, and work to overcome the state of separation in our world today. The second discovery a sleepover God would make today is that most people are overscheduled and awfully busy which can sometimes leave our lives empty. Working hard to make a living, building a career, raising family, hobbies, etc., are all activities of value. But when you put them all together, you end up with a frantic and disconnected life. And right into the middle of this frenzy, God sends a baby. And you know what babies do. Babies demand our attention. They slow us down. Redirect us. Just as the coming of Jesus forced Mary and Joseph to slow down and refocus, Christ's arrival at Christmas nudges us to slow down and change our pace and our plans. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, says Matthew. Joseph stopped his plan to break up with Mary, and instead he took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she bore, had borne a son. 
and he named him Jesus. The great challenge of Christmas is to let ourselves slow down and say yes for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And the opportunity of Christmas when we do this is to experience the fullness of life that comes from following this baby, loving the Lord our God and our neighbors as ourselves, and going out to make disciples of all nations. Jesus' great commandment was love. And a sense of peace and purpose can come from following Jesus in this way. Something we can't find in jobs, athletics, or hobbies. Notice also that we can't avoid our neighbors when we focus on Jesus and walk in his way. After all, you can't practice love and discipleship in isolation. That's just another good reason to welcome the God who sleeps over. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.